what is up my youtube family welcome back to my channel if this is your first time here then it's just welcome to my channel and now welcome back go ahead and hit the subscribe button because you will not be disappointed y'all y'all first of all let me say in my last video y'all know i was not sitting up here butt naked filming and the thing is somebody facetimed me right before i started filming and they were like are you naked and i'm like no and i pulled my my dress up i had on like a strapless dress i was like no here's my dress and they were like oh and i still didn't think to say in the video like by the way i'm not naked i was sitting here bare face but i was not sitting here bare -faced, okay and also I don't know how I lost the clip of me showing what the lady from the plane got me as a gift. Like I was saying, I don't know if she said that this was for me or that this was me. You let me know what you think. But here go my girl. Is it giving me? You let me know. Y'all, my home is filled with so much drama lately and it ain't even human drama. If y'all remember a couple videos back, I posted a clip, I think I posted to Instagram, where Bella was trying to, you know, she was trying to mount Ella Fantasia, Blue's wife, and Blue caught her in the act, and they had a little, you know, he had to pull on Ella Fantasia's hair for cheating on him with his sister. Fast forward to, like, yesterday, I had decided, because the dogs, like, Bella lately has been showing interest in Ella Fantasia, and Blue is real protective of her. Like, he doesn't play with her. He just goes to pound town on Miss Elephantasia, and that's it. Like, she's reserved for special occasions only. And them special occasions happen every night around 7.45. And if it's not 7.45 p.m., she is not to be touched. That being said, I was like, well, let me go to the store and get Bella a big stuffed animal that she can have and stay claim over. So I went and got Bernard. And when I tell you that Bernard and Bella, I guess, hit it off like maybe it was love at first sight because within moments of receiving Bernard, this was Bella and Bernard. So I'm thinking all is well. Now she has her lover. He has his lover. But Blue is like, wait, we got a new lover? Like, no, she got a new lover, sir. Y'all know Blue is very, he's very fluid, okay? He goes where the love is or where the love is not too fast for him to catch it pin it down so he locks eyes with bernard and he wants a piece but bella is not going for it so she has been like protecting bernard all day it's a whole big thing well bella got caught slipping and blue he decided he was gonna get him a little piece of bernard at least until i blew his cover i was very messy i was trying to look out for my girl bella you hunting your man Anyway, I shouldn't have been trying to look out for my girl because while Blue was in the back taking his nap, this girl decides she's going to stack Bernard on top of Elephantasia and like get on top of them and just, child, at this point, I don't know what to do. Like people wonder why I don't watch much TV. The entertainment be live in my home. Okay, and it's so messy. But anyway, on to today's video, we're gonna go over four different stories today, all of which are about very bizarre events. The thing is, some of them are true events and some of them are completely made up. I believe this might be a pretty long one, so I will not ramble more. I'll instead go ahead and get into the first one, which is about a very toxic woman, literally. One evening, 31-year-old Gloria Ramirez is rushed to a California hospital for a rapid heartbeat, low blood pressure, and she is also having a lot of trouble breathing. Now, Gloria is conscious, but she is also incoherent. So a lot of the questions from the medical staff are being met with answers that just do not match up. And six weeks ago, she was diagnosed with late stage cervical cancer. So initially, the doctors think that what she is experiencing today is likely related to that. They treat her with several different drugs to try to stabilize her vital signs. However, nothing is working. When it becomes very clear that she is not responding well to the medicines that they're giving her, the staff decides to defibrillate her heart. But when the nurse removes her shirt to apply the electrodes, they notice a very oily sheen that covers Gloria's skin. And another member of the medical staff notices a very strong fruity and garlicky odor coming from her mouth. And as if this is not odd enough, when they take a blood sample from her, they notice that her blood smells of ammonia. And not only that, there are also these tiny manila color particles floating in her blood. Now it is obvious to doctors at this point that whatever is currently going on with Gloria today is not related 
related to her cancer. However, they don't know what it could be and from there things just get even more bizarre because one by one, the nurses that are attending to her begin to faint and another member of the medical staff develops a difficulty breathing. When one of the nurses that had initially fainted regains her consciousness, she cannot move her legs or her arms. The staff is then ordered to remove all emergency room patients from the hospital and briefly relocate them to the parking lot because at this point over 23 people have become ill as a result of tending to Gloria and five of them have now been admitted to the hospital. Only a skeleton crew is put together and allowed to go back inside of the hospital to continue to try to stabilize her. But sadly the young mother of two dies just 45 minutes after her arrival to the hospital leaving the medical staff completely puzzled and just some of them have alive themselves. But then after her death, things just get even more weird. A special team arrives in hazmat gear to handle her body and inspect the ER for any type of toxins, any type of pollutants in the air that could rationalize why all these people had gotten sick. But they find nothing. Gloria's body is then placed in an aluminum casket that is sealed and put off to the side in its own room for six days before they allow an autopsy to be done. And when the autopsy is done, it's done in a special room where the team can work in hazmat suits just in case, even after six days, she is still poisonous. As the story gains traction in the news, the press dubs Gloria the toxic lady because nobody can get close to her without becoming ill themselves. And even when they perform this autopsy on the sixth day, the medical examiner still cannot figure out what is wrong with her or what was wrong with her. A total of three autopsies are performed. The first one that happened six days after, another one after six weeks post-mortem, and then a third two weeks after that. The medical team that worked on her concluded that there were signs of Tylenol, lidocaine, codeine, and an anti-nausea medicine that breaks down and produces a substance that is related to ammonia, which could explain the ammonia scent in her blood, according to them. The toxicology report also says that Gloria had large amounts of another substance called dimethyl sulfane that occurs naturally in the body but typically disappears quickly like it has a lifespan of about three days max however gloria had so much of this in her system that it was still registering as three times the normal amount six weeks after she had died. After holding onto her body for two whole months, county officials finally released her severely decomposed body to be properly buried by her family. And of course, they're free to have their own independent autopsy performed if they wish. When she was released, they also announced her official cause of death, heart failure due to kidney failure brought on by her late stage of cancer. All the substances that were found in excess in her blood, they say were not lethal amounts and likely did not cause her to have any kind of medical reaction or medical distress to the magnitude in which she was experiencing. Now her family, they were livid at the results of the investigation. They felt like it was lazy and that they just did not care to really truly find out what had happened to Gloria. They believed that the hospital in its deplorable conditions had caused Gloria's death and that they were trying to make it something else so they can cover that up. Now the hospital had been cited for several violations in the past for not meeting standards, but the county's investigation finds that currently it is not below standard. But they also conclude that the hospital staff that had been affected by Gloria's presence had just suffered from too much stress and mass hysteria. They claim that the staff's reaction was all psychological and it was triggered by the smell of garlic on Gloria's breath when she could have simply just had garlic for dinner. Now the medical staff is pissed because girl now you're playing with us like we are not just imagining illnesses. They demand that this is really looked into a second time and not just swept under the rug as something that was of their imagination. After exposure, one of the nurses had actually spent two weeks in the ICU struggling to breathe. Now, Pat Grant is tasked with the second investigation and he finds what he believes to be the true cause and it is not everybody's imagination. His findings are that Gloria had been covering her skin in a DMSO as a possible way to cure her cancer or at least 
absolve herself of the pain. DMSO creams were very popular in the early 60s and a little bit before then they were believed to be this cure-all cream. Medical research in the early 60s actually led doctors to believe that DMSO creams could relieve pain, anxiety. Athletes would be told to rub these creams on their muscles to relieve aching after games or practice. Then one of these doctors little studies and tests used on mice shows that DMSO can very quickly ruin your eyesight very quickly and very easily. In 1965, it was deemed officially as a toxic substance. But that most people stopped using it, but it was still circulating on the underground scene and you could still get it on the black market. A lot of people swore by it and believed that it really did work. However, it is no longer being mass produced and is no longer readily available. And by the late 70s, the only way to get your hands on DMSO is as a degreaser at a hardware store. Now, the DMSO found in the degreaser is a lot more concentrated than what was found back in the day in those creams. And looking deeper into the issues that the medical research had uncovered, Pat finds that when exposed to oxygen, there is a chemical compound that is released as a gas, and these vapors are extremely toxic. They destroy cells in the eyes, the lungs, and the mouth. And Gloria had been administered oxygen by the paramedics who first responded to their 911 call. Now, so much of these vapors in anyone's body can cause convulsions, delirium, paralysis, and at room temperature or like close to room temperature, a little warmer, these vapors will crystallize, which is what was found floating in her blood. Of the 20 symptoms described by the medical staff that night, 19 of them match symptoms of people who had been exposed to these vapors back in the day and was negatively impacted. So it turns out, of course, that the medical staff was not hallucinating. They were really, really out here poised. Now, this is also a plausible explanation for her shiny skin because the degreaser would have been a little, you know, a little shiny. So her using a DMSO degreaser or cream to relieve her pain brought on by her illness is deemed a very plausible explanation for what happened to her. However, her family denies that she did not use any such cream or substance. Now, their private pathologist is unable to determine a cause of death because her heart was missing and they said that all of her other organs have been cross-contaminated with fecal matter. Plus, at that point, 10 weeks after her death, she was too far decomposed. Two and a half months later, she is finally laid to rest by her family who feel that they still have not gotten any closure or real answers as to what happened to her. But Pat's findings are evaluated by by professional forensic scientists, chemists, and taxologists who all agree that this is likely what occurred. Of course, with all the attention that the case got, a lot of people began to speculate, and after a while, all kind of things were being said. On to Story number two. 23 year old Francis and 21 year old John are best friends who met in high school and have since remained extremely close and they're more like brothers than friends. They spend a lot of time together. They are very familiar with each other's families and each of the guys are embraced by the other's family as an extended family member. Now, one evening, the two of them decide to go out for a drink, which they often did. This was nothing new. And their typical Saturday nights out involved a lot of drinking, okay? They get started early and they go to the wee hours of the morning. The two of them go out, they get slammed, but this night would end a lot crazier than their typical Saturday night out. Sometime in the earliest hours of Sunday morning, Francis begins to feel sick and he is throwing up everywhere. Both men are extremely intoxicated and decide that they will call it a night because maybe tonight, y'all, they have overdone it. Now because Francis is sick, John drives back to the house and Francis is hanging out of the window, throwing up out the side of the truck. John swerves to the side a bit to avoid hitting another car, but at that exact moment, he was passing a telephone pole with a vertical support wire, sideswipes it, and decapitates his best friend, Francis. 
and also knocking off the side mirror of the car. John then continues to drive the 12 miles home, parks the truck outside, goes up to his room, gets into his bed with his blood splattered clothing, leaving his headless best friend downstairs in the truck parked right outside of his family home. Now, hours later, one of the neighbors is taking a nice morning stroll with their baby daughter. When he comes upon this horrific discovery, he of course calls police right away. And when they get to the house, John is still asleep in his bed. When they wake him up, he is still very intoxicated and initially has no memories of the last couple hours of his life. The police question him a bit to try to jog his memory and he does recall swerving the car to avoid hitting another vehicle and clipping something. Not sure what, but now he's confused because he's waking up to police officers. They then explain to him what happened and that he simply had not just clipped something. And once he gets past the initial shock and disbelief because... Mind you, he didn't have any recollection and he's still a little intoxicated. So he is very taken aback and horrified and according to the police, extremely distraught and remorseful. Francis' head is found beside a bush near the telephone pole and he is then returned to his family's hometown of Louisville, Kentucky so he could be laid to rest. Now his family is heartbroken, but they recognize that this was a horrible accident, granted a preventable accident, but because they were extremely close to John as well they kind of feel for him too and John's family especially his mother is extremely empathetic to Francis's family she went to his mother hysterical with grief she prayed with her and the two women were actually able to lean on each other for like support and strength now John is placed under arrest with a hundred thousand dollar bond he was also charged with vehicular homicide and driving under the influence and this is actually not the first time, just three years before the accident, he had been jailed for driving under the influence, among other traffic violations. When John went to court, Francis' family actually showed up and asked the judge to be somewhat lenient. They have forgiven him. He's like family as well. And if he goes away to jail for a long time, it'll be like they lost two sons instead of one. In the end, John is sentenced to five years in prison. So I guess that leniency was granted. Story number three. In a quiet, very scenic town deep within the Appalachian Mountains, Arthur Cromwell is a very eccentric, peculiar kind of guy. He is known throughout this small town for collecting antique medical instruments, which most people find kind of odd. And he uses these instruments as decor in his home. So his house kind of looks like a very morbid museum. He has all kind of old rusty surgical tools. He also has very eerie models of things as well as these jars containing preserved specimens of various different creatures. Now one morning Arthur decides that he wants to throw a couple of his friends a dinner party. He invites guests that are either equally as intrigued as he is in all of these things as well as people who are repulsed by these things. And once dinner is is ready the group gathers around this large wooden table and Arthur dressed in this Victorian era surgical outfit entertains his guests with gruesome tales of bizarre medical practices over the years accompanied by this very unsettling very creepy display of his collection. Now whether they are intrigued or repulsed Arthur has everyone's attention and no one is more intrigued by all of the things than Dr. Eleanor Gray. She gets up to go examine one of the glass jars that is sitting on top of one of the dusty shelves. Now inside of this jar is a preserved octopus floating in this murky greenish liquid. Now Arthur, when she inquires about it, he tells her that this is an ancient artifact from some long forgotten medical experiment. It was very bizarre where someone had made an attempt to study a connection between cephalopods and humans. Now, Dr. Gray, she cannot resist her temptation to 
further inspect this octopus in this jar. Now, unbeknownst to her, the seal on the jar had weakened over time. So when she handles the jar by holding the top, the rest of the jar falls from her hands and shatters on the floor. And she is, of course, startled by this. She didn't mean any harm and she's very apologetic. However, breaking his jar and ruining his little artifact should be the least of her worries. Within seconds, her skin begins to lose its color and she collapses onto the floor gasping for air. Arthur and all of the other guests rush to her side in a panic, but it is too late. It is later determined that Dr. Gray had had a fatal reaction to the preservation fluid inside of the jar. Now, Arthur does not host another dinner party, but over time, this one very eerie dinner party becomes the source of several urban legends, most of which accuse him of having sinister plans for his guests at night or him of deliberately harming Dr. Gray. But all of these tales are just that. Now, our fourth and final story for the evening is about a French neurologist. Dr. Jules Cotter is taken aback by a new female patient who comes to see him with a very peculiar set of symptoms. The 43-year-old woman claims to not have a brain, not have any nerves, any lungs, any internal organs whatsoever. No stomach, no bowels, nothing. According to the woman, there is nothing left of her other than literally her skin and bones. And although she stands before him, she is actually deceased. When the doctor tries to assure her that she definitely does have organs, she insists that she definitely does not. And when the hospital staff attempt to bring her food, she refuses to eat anything or drink anything because according to her, there's nothing for her to send food and water down there too. And dead people don't need to eat anyway. She says, while most of the hospital staff think she's just out of her mind, Dr. Carter is very intrigued by this woman's claims and her commitment to this belief. He does a bit of research and finds that there was actually a Swiss scientist who had reported a case similar in which an elderly woman had made claims eerily similar to the ones that he's hearing from this woman. And according to the woman who had been studied before, she had been in her kitchen, minding her business, preparing a meal, when suddenly she felt this drafts come through. And then all of a sudden she was paralyzed on one whole side of her body. Afterwards, she had become so convinced that that numb, paralyzed side of her body was a dead half of her body. And she demanded that everybody treat her accordingly. Dare not say that that's not true. In one instance, she becomes so riled up over for her condition that in order to appease and ease her her family has to dress her up and they lay her in a coffin then pretend to mourn her and she lays there eventually falls asleep afterward they take her out remove the little dress and just tuck her into her bed in the coming months, her paralysis slowly eases up and she regains movement to that side of her body. But the paralysis continues to return sporadically here and there. And during her little walking dead flare-ups, her family just treats her with extra care. Now, reading about all of this, Dr. Carter decides to take the baton and continue the research, documenting one of the rarest diseases known to man walking corpse syndrome. His new patient appears to have no physical ailments at all. However, her belief that she has no digestive system and did not need to eat caused her to have significant weight loss. And of course, she is somewhat dehydrated and malnourished. She had also concluded that she was already dead and had been cursed to eternally walk the earth. So she had no fear whatsoever. She really believed that she could walk right out into oncoming traffic and nothing really happened to her. In short, this is a zombie, okay? Zombiana. Now, sadly, because she refuses to eat or drink, she also refuses to allow them to give her fluids. She ultimately starves to death very quickly before Dr. Carter has the opportunity to like study her extensively. Now, there have since been other cases with the same disorder and it is believed to be a lot more common than people think because it's often diagnosed as schizophrenia or presents alongside it and so they'll just use schizophrenia as a catch-all. Now let's get down to the bottom of these stories shall we? Let's see how well you did guessing which ones are factual events and which ones are completely made up. If any, story number one of Gloria Ramirez, aka the toxic lady. If you guessed that this actually took place, 
or you already knew, then you will be right. This actually is a true case that happened in February of 1994. And it actually happened exactly as I laid it out in the story. I did not tweak anything. Now, as for story number two about the best friends where one had caused the other to be decapitated and went home and went to sleep, that is actually true. This took place in August of 2004. And again, I did not change any of the details. Story number three, was it Andrew Cromwell? I'm not exactly sure and I should be. This story about the dinner party hosted by a man who has a very morbid interest is not at all factual. I started to make him like, you know, a serial killer or something, but I was like, no, we're going to stick to the theme of it being a medical emergency of some sort. And fourth and finally, story number four about the walking dead syndrome if you guessed that this one was the one that was made up you'd be wrong this one was actually factual i didn't change any of the details now it has since been named the cotter delusion syndrome after the doctor who really took on the research and this is apparently a very real thing there is nothing and no one who can convince somebody with this syndrome that they are actually with organs and still alive in 1996 there was a scottish man who had a suffered a brain injury in a motorcycle accident and he had actually become convinced that he had died during the recovery process and when his mother relocated him to South Africa with her the heat had convinced him that he had gone to hell and there was like no convincing him otherwise. In 2008 there was a 53 year old Filipino woman who scared her family when she began making claims similar to the one in the story. She would tell her family that she was rotting and cannot bear the scent of her own flesh. She would beg them to take her and bury her or at least drop her off at the board so they can get the process started. But when they realized that she was in fact serious, they decided to get her some medical help. There was also a case of a 46 year old woman that was convinced that she did not have a pulse despite nurses confirming all of her vital signs. She told them that she was no longer alive and she does not sleep. She does not eat. She hadn't eaten or gone to the restroom in months. And according to her, all of her internal organs had rotted and all of her blood had dried up. In 2013, there was also an author that had this condition. She was convinced that she had cracked the code on why she had been experiencing depression, anxiety, and feelings of unreality. A fainting spell that had occurred months prior to her onset of all of these symptoms had actually been her death. That's what she came up with. And now she's being made to live in this unending purgatory that resembles her old life. And I'm like, girl, what if, what if, what if, what if that's the thing? I was in a car accident. Got her delusion syndrome continues to baffle medical professionals to this day. What is known and understood is that this disease typically presents itself in three stages during the first stage which they refer to as germination patients just become very anxious and depressed in the second stage which they refer to as blooming they begin to develop this theory or this belief that they're dead and in the third and final stage the chronic stage it becomes almost impossible to use reason with them and convince them that they're in fact still alive but then they typically perish naturally because they stop eating and they stop drinking there is hope for people that are afflicted with this though because it is very closely related to depression and anxiety psychiatric treatments such as antidepressants have shown to help the 53 year old filipino woman whose family sought out medical help for her did come to believe again that she was alive after being treated in the same manner that you would treat a patient with anxiety and depression. At this point, the scientists are just hoping that with more research, they will be able to continue to uncover better solutions to treat it and gain an overall better understanding of the human brain itself because that girl is still a mystery. All right, that is it for this video. Let me know your thoughts down below. I want to know how you did as well. Did you already know some of these stories? Let me know what it is, please. Also, please like the video before you leave. Subscribe if you have not. As always, I appreciate you so much for spending your time with me. And I look forward to seeing you in the next one. Peace. A low blow, not low blow pressure. Handle her body and expect, expect, no. And then a third, and a third, a third. And not just sweeped under the rug, sweeped under the rug. Wow, wow. Medical research in the...
is to believe that this cream DM <sighs> agree that this is likely her cause <sighs> and all of the things. It just spread like wildfire. It just, it just took on a oh what did it do girl? <laughs> now because France is of the the <laughs> Arthur Crump Arthur Quam I can't even say his name. Study a connection between cephalopods. Cephalopods. She had been in her kitchen. I was gonna say in her kitchen. He actually became convinced that he had actually oh, too many actuallys, girl. She would beg them to take her and bury them. No. Months prior to her experiencing all of this, the a person, a person. I look like an emoji, yo. Look. Huh.